Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and all of the participants from the four corners of the globe who are now watching the Geotourism Fest and International Confer Conference 2021, bringing up the team of resilience of geotourism. Welcome back once again, everybody. For those of you who are watching virtually right now, we're going to move on to our next sessions of the Geotourism Fest and International Conference, which is going to be a presentation from experts. Who are going to be the experts on this very lovely, lovely occasions? We'll be led by our moderator, Mr. Muhammad Azizur Rahman, MSc. So ladies and gentlemen, before we go further to our uh, presentation of expert, I'm going to have to say thank you very much for those of you who've been very loyal towards our uh, event in this very lovely occasions. Thank you for those of you who are watching the opening ceremony of the Geotourism Fest and International Conference 2021. And finally, before uh, the moderator taking over the presentations of the expert, I'd like to sign off and I'm Muji Idris, have to say goodbye to you all. And I'm so sorry if there's any inconvenience caused during the opening ceremony until the panel sessions. And later on, the next uh, sessions will be taken over by our moderator. Once again, please welcome everybody, Muhammad Azizur Rahman, MSG, and I have to say goodbye to you all. I'll see you tomorrow, everybody, at the closing ceremony, and we'll take over, we'll go on to the experts' presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The conference is about to begin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon to all the experts, guests, participants, sponsors, media reporter, as well as the journalists. It's my pleasure to be a moderator in this hybrid event in the first Geotourism Festival and International Conference 2021. First of all, I would like to welcome all the experts, all the participants, and all the guests that come to this event. Uh, thanks for squeezing the time to join us today. In this session, I will continue the session from Mbak Lia. I will be the moderator for this session, the second session. Before the, before the, the conference begin, let me introduce myself. My name is Muhammad Aziz Rahman. I am a lecturer of Sekolah Tinggi Pariwisata Mataram uh, in Tourism Department. I will be moderating, moderating four, four participants, four presenters in this session. Before we begin, I have a few rules of this event. The first one, uh, this event is being recorded, be available for viewing post-conference. And the second one, if you have any question for the expert, please use the chat in the future, uh, chat feature in the Zoom webinar. The third one, if you have any technical question, please, you can reach out our team by send personal chat. And the last one, each presenter, only has 20 minutes, including Q&A session. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our presenter today, our keynote speakers. The first one is Professor Ibrahim Como with his paper about geotourism development in Asia Pacific, geopark, its potential and development. The second one is Professor Noel, Noel Scott, creative economy product in development of geotourism. The third one is Professor Jin Xiaozhi, the networking to develop geotourism in Asia Pacific. And the last one in my session is Professor Nickel Ni, nee with his paper about community-based geotourism or CBG response to change under disaster. Without any further ado, we're gonna go to the first expert, which is Professor Ibrahim Como. Let me explain or let me read uh, some of his profile. Professor or Emeritus Dr. Ibrahim Como is a scholar in the field of earth science, specialized in engineering geology, conservation geology, and sustainable science. He is a head of environment and natural resources, Cluster National Council of Professor or MPN, an international ex expert to the UNESCO Global Geopark, and as well as a lot of achievement that uh, he got. And also as a scientist, he has uh, published more than 55 books and more than 350 scientific papers. He has also published numerous articles for public awareness in magazines and also in newspapers. Okay, without further ado, I will give 
this time for Professor Ibrahim Como. Are you there? Uh, can you hear my voice? Hello, Prof. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Yeah, hello, hello. Oh, yeah, I can hear your voice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please, Professor, time is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope my presentation will be shown by uh, uh, your staff, or shall I okay. put myself? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum uh, and very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have very short time, 20 minutes. I'm going to talk about geotourism development in Asia Pacific geoparks. Uh, a little bit on the background and then I'm going to uh, give some example and maybe some lesson learned. Uh, can I have a, a next slide, please? Okay. Uh, geotourism actually is a new product, new tourism product. Uh, mainly, uh, it uses knowledge as the, uh, the ingredient or uh, we promote knowledge-based tourism. And uh, the main thing is about utilizing value of geological resources, uh, especially based on the geological story, uh, whether it is about evolution of the earth or processes. Uh, it also involves about aesthetic value, in inspirational, uh, it involves recreational and most importantly, uh, geotourism also link geology, uh, biology and cultural heritage. Uh, geotourism has, has been well developed in UNESCO Global Geopark. Uh, in fact, most of the UNESCO Global Geopark uh, promote geotourism and uh, income, uh, societal income, uh, uh, mainly based from this geotourism. But uh, geotourism can also be promoted uh, based on the geo side, based on the geo side outside geopark. So this may be require further, further mm -hmm. discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, of course, I am not going to dwell with this definition, but we, I just show you two definitions so that we are in sync in discussing geotourism. One is from National Geography. If you look at this definition, uh, geotourism is like almost everything. Tourism that sustain and enhance ge geographical character, meaning more of a geogra uh, geography, uh, looking at the environment, culture, aesthetic, uh, heritage, and also a well-being of the resident. But uh, I like to refer on the uh, definition based on the Ar Aroka Declaration in 2011, where uh, it involves uh, sustaining and enhancing identity of the territory, but taking into consideration the link between geology, environment, culture, aesthetic heri uh, heritage and well-being of the resident. Uh, basically, uh, the geological component is uh, need to be look uh, in integration to uh, other aspect of the tourism. Uh, next slide. When we look at this geotourism in Geopark, uh, basically, we are utilizing geosite. Geosite is an area or site or landscape of international value or national value or a local significance. So, uh, geosite is actually the main ingredient, ingredient in developing geotourism. Uh, most of the geosite have many attractions apart from for conservation purposes, but they have a lot of attraction. First, they have uh, scientific knowledge related to the evolution of the earth. It has a natural history. It has a natural beauty, 
uh, have a uniqueness, have grand grandeur. It is suitable for recreational value. It has also unique, uh, sometimes special biological and also cultural heritage. So all this can be used, uh, can be combined and used for geotourism. And uh, geocide also uh, closely related to the cultural and the belief of the local or indigenous community, meaning that uh, within the geocide, uh, almost all the heritage and the connection with the biology and the and the cultural aspect can be uh, utilized. <laughs> uh, Geopark encouraged geocide to be conserved, but at the same time, uh, geocide is well suited for uh, sustainable use, mainly geotourism. And, and in using and in using geo, geo site, uh, usually we look at the tourism site, meaning where is the exact place uh, uh, tourists should visit in the geo site. Uh, the recreational site, what can we do in the geo site? Uh, we develop geo trail. Uh, we have a geo product, all kind of geo pro product and and also the hospitality, hospitality for uh, tourism activity like uh, uh, place to stay, uh, restaurant, coffee, coffee house, and some basic facility needed for the geotourism. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, if, we, if, we, if we look at the geotourism in Jopa, uh, take, taking geotourism in Jopa uh, as an example, uh, within the geopark, we have an area like the blue color geopark. There are maybe one or two or more biological site, bio site, whether it is a, a conservation area or national park or state park. And we have uh, several geo site. Sometimes some of the geo site uh, within uh, bio site, uh, sometimes it is outside the bio site. And we also have a cultural site. So, in geotourism, uh, we should be able to utilize geosite as the basis for the tourism attraction. Then we use biosite, uh, bio biodiversity conservation area, and the cultural site as an additional attraction or a complementary attraction. Then we, we develop geotrail to provide link between uh, to, tourism a, a, attraction and the story. So we can have several links that give emphasis on certain aspect. Uh, can be uh, emphasis on the aspect uh, evolution of geology or beauty of the landscape or a combination of nature culture uh, story about the about the geopark. So uh, geotourism in geopark should utilize almost everything, uh, almost all heritage. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to my topic, which is uh, geotourism in Asia Pacific. Uh, mostly uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, the recreational area and landscape of natural beauty has been uh, developed as tourism area. And then further develop as a geosite or geotrail in the geopark. So before geopark, this place has already been there and tourism has already taken place. Secondly, uh, the development include uh, creating a new geopark museum, uh, redefine geotrail uh, and also provide new information board with geological information and the additional tourism uh, tourism facility. Uh, another thing that is new uh, actually is uh, making local people actively involved as a management staff, guide, uh, or workers. And uh, local people uh, around the area or around the geosite can participate in their tourism base business. So they can have their own small, small business to get to take advantage from the from the geosite and the geotourism activity. Next slide. 
Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I take a few examples uh, in my presentation. For example, in Langkawi, UNESCO Global Geo Park, we have a couple of uh, geo trail for geo tourism. One of the most important one is Machinchang Peak Geo Trail. Uh, this Machinchang Peak Geo Trail uh, utilizing landscape and aesthetic value of the geo park. Uh, it, it is also introduced uh, the concept of Machinchang Cambria Geoforest Park, uh, the combination of biology and geology, and, uh, and looking at the, uh, one of the oldest rock formation in, in, in the country. Uh, the tourism attraction here actually is Sky Cap and Sky Bridge meaning we have a sky cap uh, going up and then you, uh, in the picture you can see a sky bridge where people can have uh, do recreation while uh, enjoying the scenic beauty of the place. Um, the attraction here is a story about landscape. Uh, this is an uh, anticlinal mountain with uh, various uh, unique peaks that can can uh, can provide the aesthetic beauty, uh, a sandstone forest, a special forest, uh, with stunted, for, uh, stunted tree, uh, and also the uh, legend of uh, Mat Chin Chang uh, is a giant that used to be uh, once a giant that has been uh, ch uh, uh, changed into a uh, uh, the people uh, in, into the mount, mountain. Uh, in in, in uh, Machinchang Peak uh, Geo Trail, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the facility is top class, top class recreational facility, and currently is the uh, top tourism site of Langkawi. Uh, uh, prior to PKP, uh, uh, we have more than 1 million visitors per year. So next slide, uh, next slide, please. For the next slide, uh, we uh, here we call it Bayu Geo Trail of Kubang Bada. Uh, this is a new Geo Trail. It's not, it's a, just a, a fisherman uh, village uh, prior to the Geo Park. But when uh, Langkawi became Geo Park, we developed this area uh, with the idea of geotourism. So, uh, we utilize three geosites, which is uh, Go Pinang, Pulau Jumuru, and Tanjung Buta, and also a mangrove forest reserve as the component. Then, uh, we look at most suitable uh, attraction. We found 11 uh, tourist sites that can be uh, use uh, I I listed in this like Kubang Badak Fisherman Village uh, village. So we introduce the the people the community. Then we introduce Kubang Badak Island, a small island in the middle where we can see the develop development of or the, the biodiversity of the mangrove. Uh, we have a Menorah Hill, a small hill used to be a place for. Uh, Siamese people uh, perform their cultural, which is menorah. Uh, then Sungai Siam will uh, uh, traveling along the river to see the mangrove. Uh, we look at uh, Jemuro Island for uh, fossil uh, trilobite, uh, Tanjung Buta for uh, rock formation, uh, Machinchang rock formation and Kubang Bada landscape for a uh, cave experience. So from zero, uh, after introducing this, uh, before PKP, we have roughly about 50,000 people visitors per year and completely uh, managed by the- Recording local. in progress. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, uh, I show some of the example Recording from Recording stopped. Uh, this is a colorful hill in Zhangji Geopark. Uh, it used uh, ha hamuki land uh, landform 
uh, and the color of the landform actually depend on the uh, strata weathering and this kind of uh, landscape and landscape beauty is rare globally and highly attractive so uh, geopark zangyi geopark provide first class facility including a visitor center recreational area observatory deck station research station and even hel helicopter visit so this is one of the a uh, typical typical uh, recording in progress kind of activity in uh, in china in jopa in china and in this area more recording than visitor uh, uh, visit this place every year next slide please uh, okay uh, uh, in 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 zangji they have another place another another area which is uh, also a fantastic place uh, it has a uh, window lattice and palace shapes uh, dancia landform uh, it's part of the world heritage site of Ch china dancia red sandstone outstanding landscape uh, and here also they build a first class facility including visitor center recreational area and all the necessary for for the tourism uh including the cultural connection with the people uh, living around that place and uh this site is developed and managed by local authority and uh, two years to three, two years ago it's about 1 million visitor uh, came to this place uh, next slide uh another example uh, from china from zijin dong unesco global jopa if some of you still remember this is a place for Asia Pacific Geopark Network uh, conference uh, three three or four years ago. So I like this place very much because it involved a good trail, uh, part of the karst landscape of Zhejiang River uh, attraction, including underground river cave, Tengu Natural Bridge. You can see in the picture. Uh, Daka Kau Tian King, Tan Tian King or Depression is a gorge and a karst biodiversity with 400 meters sky leaf. So at the end of this trail, you have a sky leaf and this is also developed and managed by a local authority. And uh, three, four years ago, more than 200,000 visitors per year. Next slide. Uh, okay, I give some example. Now I try to conclude uh, what is the kind of geotourism in Asia Pacific Geopark. Uh, usually it is based on the well developed geo trail, and the route connects several geotourism sites within and between geo sites. So, within geo site or between geo site. Uh, and usually it relates to recreational, adventure, and educational trail uh, it can be walking bike boat cable car car or combination uh, the attraction is always landscape beauty with some geological or cultural or even the combination of uh, heritage uh, it uh, also look at the give emphasis on the conservation of nature uh, good facility for visitors uh, they have a tourism story and landscape interpretation, good management, well, actually well-developed management, and most importantly, local community participated, uh, actively participated in this. And uh, the income uh, mainly from gate collection and a small business as a main, in, uh, as a main income for, for the tourism activity. Okay, last slide. Maybe this is a last slide. Or... So... Uh, my concluding remarks, uh, each UNESCO Global Geopark in Asia Pacific has between 5 to 10 geo trail for geotourism activity. Uh, mainly, it is a redevelopment from the existing tourism, uh, can be nature tourism, can be ecotourism, can be culture tourism, uh, and closely related to outstanding landscape beauty. But uh, having Geopark 
they re-look at the Joe Trail and put geological uh, knowledge and link uh, geological knowledge with natural and cultural heritage as the main attraction. Uh, Geopark provides technical and financial support for geotourism development. So, uh, many, many of these uh, geotrail and geotourism activity uh, are managed by the uh, Geo Geopark Authority. Uh, we can see clearly it improves uh, the well-being of local community uh, through active uh, participation as a worker, as a staff of the geotourism product, but also as a small business businesses. So at the same time, it sustain uh, sustainable utilization of geological resources, meaning that the geological resources is being used while uh, conservation can still be uh, conserv conservation of the geosite is uh, being looked after. Uh, I think that is my presentation. Um, uh, I, I hope you get some gist from my, my presentation with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation, Prof. Uh, so now we are going to the Q&A session. Uh, let me check if there is any question for Professor Ibrahim Como. Okay, uh, there is only one question, Prof. It's yeah. about uh, comparison between the, develop, the development of the geopark uh, around uh, Asia Pacific, actually. Uh, so, if we compare from uh, Japan, China, Malaysia, and Indonesia, in Japan, they built the geopark uh, using, uh, how to say, it, it's uh, without damaging any environmental. But if we see that in Indonesia, there is a, pro there is a problem actually in Lombok, in Lombok, uh, there is an investor that they want to build a cable car in Rinjani. So the problem is a lot of people disagree about this plan. But if we can see that in Malaysia, there is a cable car in Malaysia. In jo I forgot where is it, but Langkawi, Langkawi, I've, yeah. Yeah, Langkawi. I, I've been there. I've mm -hmm. been there. It's such a good place actually. But in here, uh, people disagree about this plan. Uh, so, actually, what is happened in your uh, in your point of view? Actually, what is the difference between these countries, Japan, China, and Indonesia? Actually, yeah, that's okay. the question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, I can give example. In in Japan, the tourism has taken place for a very very long time. Not 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 just geotourism. It's just nature or cultural. Uh, so when they have a geopark, they just uh, improve by adding knowledge, by adding geological knowledge. So so much so that in Japan, not much uh, additional infrastructure. They use uh, existing infrastructure and just add on more uh, content for the tourism. But if you visit China, that just so I show some example, yeah. Uh, they develop the place very well with fantastic infrastructure. Million of ringgit museum, new museum, fantastic trail, uh, sky leaf, sky cap, all kind of thing. But at the same time, they put emphasis on the sustainability of the development and also integrity of the uh, geosite, integrity of the geological site. So they, they build in infrastructure very well, but at the same time, they, may, they conserve uh, in, in China. In, in Malaysia, uh, Langkawi is a good example. I give just now uh, two examples. One example where uh, government have developed very well infrastructure, uh, sky cap, and also sky bridge. Uh, but we build this in such a way that minimum damage to the environment. Uh, there is almost, almost no da damage. The, the sky cap uh, have only two uh, steel and uh, half a kilometer apart. So the, uh, the forest there is still intact. Same as in the top of the mountain, 
uh, the sky bridge is using uh, one one f- uh, foundation uh, uh, one one found foundation and the, the the bridge is like hanging so the forest is not damaged uh, and because of that infrastructure uh, people are attracted and a million of people come visit if there is no infrastructure nobody will enjoy uh, the the landscape uh, honestly uh, if you want to develop geo site for geo tourism you have to build infrastructure uh, and uh, of course uh, you must take care of the integrity of the geo, geo site uh, don't 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 ever uh, destroy your geo site at the expense of the infrastructure but there is no issue of de- developing infrastructure uh, for uh, geo tourism in the geo site thank you Thank you so much, Professor. So the point is, it's okay to modernize the geopark as long as it's still you're still taking care of the environment. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, once again, thank you so much for Professor Ibrahim Como uh, for the presentation. And now we're gonna go to the second presenters. The second. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome, Prof. Please give applause for Professor Ibrahim Como. For the second expert is Professor Noel Scott with his title is Economic Product Econo- Creative Economy Product in Development of Geotourism. Hello Prof Noel Scott, are you there? Can you hear my voice? Yes, I can. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, clearly. Okay. Uh, okay, Prof, time is yours. Please. Oh. Well. Thank you very much, and um, uh, so I'd like to f- first of all thank the organisers of the GFS and the International Conference. Um, I've been attending, and uh, I'm impressed with the quality. Although this is a, uh, although I'm not there in person, I'd very much love to be in Lombok today. Um, I'm in Brisbane in Australia, but um, it, the presentation so far has been wonderful. So congratulations. I'd also like to thank you. Um, as the uh, moderator, uh, Pakma Rahman, uh, Professor Como, and my other two speakers, uh, the other two speakers, uh, Professor Jin and Professor Nye. So uh, it's great to be amongst such um, illustrious company. My talk today is going to be about, uh, I'll just share my screen. So can you see this? Uh, can you see my screen now? Yep. Oh, good. Thank you. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, geotourism, but probably some of the things that fit around geotourism and the idea of developing, in particular, uh, Mount Rinjani, the Mount Rinjani area uh, for tourism. So, uh, Um, what we're trying to do, of course, is to develop um, products, uh, let's call them um, uh, uh, products for tourists, but those products should have some sort of social benefit as well as ensure the protection of the environment. And one of the, one of the ways that governments, uh, especially in Indonesia, are very interested in developing uh, tourism products is to use this idea of creative tourism, and so that's where I want to talk about where does creative, where does the creative economy, where does creative tourism fit in Lombok tourism development, and how does it relate to the Mount Rinjani Geopark? And it is interesting. Um, I, I've got a screen clipping there from uh, Dr. Uh, Thilstrup, who, in his talk, um, gave some um, interesting points about uh, developing experiences related to geoparks and a story, storytelling and, um, and, and how that may be able to uh, perhaps in, empower local people. So I'll, I'll try and bring that theme into the presentation as well. So, uh, but I'll, before I want to, before I focus too much on the product, I want to sort of think about where a geopark fits in the visitor journey, the 
the trip that I might take to come to Lombok. Um, I would make a booking, I'd journey there on an aeroplane, I'd get there, I'd collect some information, I might go to my accommodation, find a place to eat, uh, go on to have some, uh, go to visit some attractions and amenities, um, experience infrastructure environment, return home. And what I've tried to do is put some crosses, these um, r uh, yellow crosses are places where creativity and creative tourism products can actually fit in to the overall journey. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But the other thing I want you to think about is where Lombok is at the moment and how it's developing to think about where perhaps uh, Mount Rinjani in the geopark fits. So, um, of course, originally we, we had development in the Gili Islands and Sengigi. Oh, well, first, of course, it was in Mataram, then um, Sengigi, uh, and then most recently we've got some development down here um, in the south. Uh, and you can think about that Oh, and then, of course, we've got this area, which is a bit, it's a national park, so it's not, there's not a lot of infrastructure there, which people access from a variety of different um, entrance points. And if we, th there's a very interesting model about how tourism destinations develop. Um, if we imagine that we've got an island, you can see a series of different stages in their development from an initial place one initial destination, perhaps we might call that Mataram or Sengigi, to the starting to develop multiple destinations. So now we've got um, the, uh, the uh, developments down the bottom there. And after that, we start to get this connection from those resorts into the hinterland. And to me, that's, that's where Lombok is at the moment. It's starting to develop um, secondary places uh, where people might visit, often on an excursion, on a touring loop. And so that, that again, is something to fit in to think about where we are, because when we're talking about accessing uh, Mount Rinjani in a geopark, we're talking about either two things. Um, so here's, here's sort of a, like a... a a strategy or, or a picture of the island. We've got our three main places where people live. We've got a number of access points which are green. Uh, people use those to trek into Mount Rinjani, but they also use them as places to visit on tours. So we've got really three different uses for the areas surrounding Mount Rinjani. Uh, we've got some small-scale overnight accommodation. We've got day tripping to these um, access points. And then we've got trekking into the area. And one of the things um, uh, I'd like you to think about, um, even at this point, is where are the places where people will go shopping or have casual dining on their tours and things? Are there, is that developed? So let's uh, we'll come back to that. The other thing I want you to think about is the reason why we're do doing this stuff. Why are we developing the um, Mount Rinjani Geopark? Well, we want to try and improve the livelihoods and the money, the, the income that lo local people get. There's no point in having a geopark if there's no benefit for the people who live around it. And so, again, we should be thinking about developing products and services around or within this geopark that benefit local people. And that can do that in a number of different ways. It could be in accommodation, food, tours and excursions, handicrafts. We might be doing it through transportation or um, village homestays and things. Uh, maybe we're going to use local food maybe we're talking about uh, farmers and so on. So again, you should be thinking when you're developing tourism products, creative tourism products or any type, 
how you can link those products to local people in some of these areas. Okay. So what's creativity about? What are we trying to do with creative tourism that can add value to Mount Rinjani tourism? The idea, basically, and a number of people have talked about this before, is to take some existing resource, let's call it a geosite, or let's call it um, local culture, or local food produce, or local crafts, which are already being developed. And what we want to try and do is use creativity and developing experiences, which relate to them, to add value, to increase the amount of money that people get. And we do that through identifying the resource and then working out how we can add value to it with creativity and add experiences, maybe myths and symbols and emotion and performance, which will help us to make an experience out of what is a product. All right, so what we've got here, this is the equation down the bottom here. Core resource plus creativity and innovation equals added value. That's what you want to do. And what you can do is identify many products or core resources that already exist and add things to them. Add performance, emotion, atmosphere, symbols, myths and legend, tell stories to make something, to make that product into an experience which is unique, meaningful and memorable, so on. So creativity and innovation are the way, the, the reason you're doing it is to add value, make more money from your product improve your promotion and in, perhaps increase the number or certainly the amount of money that tourists spend in the area. So here's, here's some ideas. Um, I, uh, I like showing these photos. So I, uh, I, I'll, I've got an example here of something that I know is very uh, famous about uh, some of the areas in uh, around Mount Rinjani, and that's the traditional cloth weaving. Okay, so that's a well, it's a wonderful thing. It's great tradition, and it's beautiful to see. And so, wh what I was thinking about, well, how is how can we increase the value of this? How we can we add um, experience and creativity? And so, we're going to move from traditional cloth. That's what. The pro that's what the resource is. And we're going to think about how we can add value. So we could be creative. Uh, we could start to um, maybe, I saw this as an example um, uh, this morning, where using um, arts and crafts to, um, but contemporary arts and crafts to add value to the area. Well, we might be able to do that with um, souvenirs as well. We might be able to add some contemporary design creativity to produce souvenirs, which might be more uh, able to be sold for more money. But you can do it through experiences as well. You might want to, uh, when you're making traditional cloth, you can actually demonstrate the weaving. That's good. But then you can add co-creation. You can actually do weaving classes where a person learns how to weave along with the people weaving. Or another example, um, traditional cloth is dyed. There's a dyeing process that um, is used. So you might be able to actually demonstrate that or even allow people to try working or producing cloth that is dyed using this traditional process. That's another that might lead to additional tour income. Um, and then my favourite, my favourite, I'm sorry, I, I'm a bit funny, but uh, 
Traditional cloth can be made into clothing, so you might be able to sell clothing. But another great thing to do, which I haven't really seen much in Lombok, is this idea. So this is in um, uh, Padang in uh, West Java, uh, West Sumatra. And there you can go to a um, an interesting palace, but then you can get dressed up in traditional clothes and get your photo taken. Or here's an example in Oman where you go to a museum and you can get dressed up in the traditional clothing of the people there. So I'd love to do that in Lombok. You just need to tell me where I can do it. And of course, by the way, this is a great way of earning money. Um, other ways to be creative um, is to identify a story and then develop that as as something to talk to tourists about. So here, traditionally, you know, the, the Samalas um, uh, um, explosion of 1257, where the top of this mountain disappeared and caused uh, a little ice age in Europe, apparently. So what a tremendous, um, interesting geological story. Um, but there are many others that you could develop. Um, how my mother made die for Ikat. You could talk about the history of a family, how they make the dye, how that helps, uh, how they use that in their, in their weaving. Or here's a good one, how to win at stick fighting. It's not just looking at stick fighting, but you might actually learn out how to do it, learn some of the basic techniques. And another one that I found fascinating in in Lombok is the idea of sitting, you know, most villages have got one of these um, uh, places where people sit and discuss issues in a village. That's a fascinating story, but I didn't know about that until someone told me the story of it. So all of these things are ways to be creative and provide experiences for people which will add value either to a tour or to a visit to a village. And, but there are many different types of stories. So think about what you can do. Um, certainly, you can add experiences. So you might own a small accommodation establishment in the, in the mountains, but you want more people to stay overnight. So you add some stories or excitement at night that people want to see, which means that they stay overnight. Or you add other things for people to do during the day, such as a creative tour where you make things. Um, here's some ideas about using creativity and innovation. Theming your product. So we're in a geopark, so we've got to mountains and volcanoes and things. What about having mountain or volcano cakes. Or this one apparently is called a, a volcano drink. I don't know why, but uh, so, so you could have themed food and drink. Or, and I know uh, Melly has uh, done some of this work before, um, in accommodation you could have room decorations themed in the type of uh, theme of a volcano. So this is, a, uh, this is called a lava lamp. I love it. They were very big in the 60s. But you can get those and maybe they'll help to demonstrate the flow of lava in the, in the crust or the mantle. And another idea of adding value through creativity or perhaps innovation in, uh, you know, in the areas around Rinjani, there are many handicrafts, wood, wood crafts, handwoven cloth we've talked about, ketak boxes, bamboo furniture, pottery, rattan work, and also a whole series of different types of agriculture. Um, now, one of the things you might think about doing is adding value by taking the vanilla and somehow using that in some food that the tourists might like. Or 
you might like to think about taking cacao and turning it into chocolate. Or you might want to think about well, coffee beans, but offering coffee to people. And I, uh, when I was traveling around in Indonesia, this was a few years ago in, in around Lombok, I didn't see many good coffee shops, but that's one of the things that at least Australian tourists are very interested in. So you also need to think about not just developing these experiential products, but working out how you're going to use them. Um, so you, you need to be able to tell people about them and sell them somehow. So that's how are you going to take your creative and innovative tourism products and turn them into a tour and who's going to sell it? How are you going to advertise it? One of the things I would strongly think, suggest you think about is establishing some tourist villages, which are places where people can do shopping for local goods or even to uh, have just uh, nice food, a, a relaxing coffee or some sweets and, and sugary food or something, something that's a bit of a treat. Um, and also, so that's about linking to the customer th through, uh, who is a self-drive or an independent traveler. This is how you might link to the tourist through distributors, through tours. But there's plenty of things. So I've certainly seen some wonderful photos of the culture of Lombok and this one, which is perhaps a more contemporary take on Mount Rinjani and geotourism and how you can connect it to uh, tourists through some sort of innovation. So in conclusion, and I, I've, so I spoke, I've gone pretty quickly, but um, what I want you to think about is innovation. So tourism works by development and there's a number of wonderful things that are happening in the villages around Mount Rinjani. Um, maybe you can help those things by finding innovative and motivated people and giving them a few opportunities to develop their creative products. If you do that, never take the first idea. Brainstorm a hundred creative and innovative ideas and then evaluate them for the tourist interest, the amount of money you can get from it, the environmental impact and the benefits for local people and decide which of the hundred you're going to, you're going to actually implement. Um, think about innovation in terms of different types of customers, perhaps. People who are taking day trips, I think there's opportunities there for innovation in terms of experiences, but also even just shopping, souvenirs and uh, food. For people that are staying overnight, it's about experiences, perhaps even things to do of a night time uh, or early in the morning. And for trekking people, that, that seems to be where most of the focus of products are, product development is occurring in um, uh, in Lombok or, or around Mount Rinjani at the moment. That's good, but that's only a small percentage of all the people who are visiting the Mount Rinjani Geo Park area. Um, resources, you've got heaps of resources. Wonderful culture. Really interesting traditional food. Some wonderful traditions, heritage. Um, you've got some beautiful nature. We've talked about that. So you've got lots of resources, but what you need to do is just move them through a bit of creativity and innovation to add value to them. And in particular, I'd like you to think about um, locating, this might be a government task, planning and locating for some areas which could become tourist hubs and in those areas, you would have um, uh, a bit more concentration in uh, retail outlets, shopping, and food and beverage prov provision. 
Okay, so thank you very much. That's um, that's my talk, and I'm very happy to take it. any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for the outstanding presentation. Thank you. Yeah, uh, since we are running out of time, uh, sorry for the participant, so there will be no Q&A. But of if uh, you are wondering about something to Professor Noel Scott, you can ask him by personal chat or something, or by email. Is that okay, Prof? Of course, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Now we're going to move to the third one. Is Professor Qin Xiaochi with his paper about the networking to develop geotourism in Asia Pacific. Hello, Prof. Qin Xiaochi. Are you there? Hello, Prof. Yep, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Ni hao. Yeah, hello now. I don't know how to share my screen. Okay. But I'm not alone to share my screen. I'd, I'd ask the, the, the operator to let me to share my screen. Okay. Uh, but before you start, let me read some of your profile the, to let people know that you are a yeah. lecturer in Institute of Geology, Chinese Academy of Geological Science, and also in ASICA Pacific Geopark Network Advisory Committee Coordinators. Okay. Uh, without any further ado, Time's yours, Prof. Please. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be asked to give a talk here uh, and the Geotourism Festival. So I was asked to tell something about uh, networking, what's the role the networking played in the development of geotourism in Asia Pacific region. So this is a big uh, title, so I can give just some general ideas about that, cannot go further into details. First of all, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to Rijani Lombak UGGP for organizing the second geotourism festival in such a difficult time to show the resilience of the UGGP. And this time, this is a half rate uh, fest geotourism and uh, together with an international conference of 2021. I have to say, Urjani uh, Lombard UGGP has set a very good example for our Asian Pacific Geoparks Network in this respect. So the geotourism, so, so far as I understand, it means or it should be a sustainable tourism. So it must benefit the local community and the society without sacrificing the future of the next generation. So uh, this is just a general idea about that. And, uh, but what's the opposite side for the unsustainable development or such, uh, unsustainable tourism? Uh, it's very common in the Eastern Pacific region. And this is not go away, that is a mass tourism. So in many areas, people will find, especially in big holidays, you find mass tourism. This is not a, uh, I mean, it's a, a, a way of tourism we are encouraging, and this cannot be classified as one uh, of the geotourism. So geotourism should be sustainable ones. So the second way, geotourism should be responsible tourism. It needs to minimize the negative environmental social and economic impacts and increasing the benefits to the communities. So this is a very uh, important at the moment because now we are in this pandemic time. There are still some uh, geoparks within our uh, Asian Pacific Geoparks Network which are doing some or carrying out some activities which cannot be 
considered responsible. Uh, this activity usually attract a lot of uh, tourists, tourists, and uh, the tourists may spend a lot of uh, money there, but this may cause some damages, especially for the protection of the, the COVID-19. This is uh, not uh, a good example for that. So we are encouraging responsible tourism. So geotourism should also be responsible. The third aspect of geotourism, I think, there should be a scientific tourism. Through so this geotourism, we need to empower the tourists and also the local residents with scientific knowledge about the territory's geological history, climate change, and then geohazard mitigation. Without all these activities, just not commercialize the tourism, that's not a geotourism. It's not good enough, it's good for all our member geoparks. So a fourth aspect for geotourism, I think it should be a tourism promoting cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. To promote and a certain tangible and uh, intangible cultural heritage of all the territories with our network is a very good aspect for the geotourism. So for this uh, uh, first, I was asked to, to talk about the role. What a role can your networking plays in the development of geotourism in the Asian Pacific region? So first of all, I'd like to make a brief introduction of Asian Pacific Geoparks Network. We are now have uh, 66 UNESCO Global Geoparks in the Asia Pacific region. It is scattered in East Asia, North or Central, or almost the whole of the Asia. You can see from the left of the picture. Uh, we have the newest member from Indonesia, that's Blinton UNESCO Global Geopark, to become member, a new member of this year. So we are now together 66 UNESCO Global Geoparks in the Asian Pacific region. Since we are scattered all in the huge area of Asian Pacific region, so the geodiversity and geoparks of this re huge region is very big. We have very high geodiversities. We have volcanic, volcanic rocks, mile lakes, karst, sandstone landforms, granite landforms, Fossil records, mineral deposits, deserts, glaciers, tundra, tectonic boundaries. A lot of uh, uh, things here can be found within the geoparks of Asian Pacific region. Uh, this high geodiversity is also forms the basis of biodiversity in the Asian Pacific region. So we we have actually extend from the tropical rare areas that in Indonesia, there's about two or three degrees south of the equator to Northeast China and the northmost part of Japan. That was almost uh, 50 degrees latitude and north. We also have job arcs in Central Asia, also in Iran. We also have that uh, in the northern margin of the high uh, Tibet plateau. So in such a geodiversity region, we have uh, a variety of plants, animals, and different fillers. So the cultural diversity, high cultural diversity is, is also a significant uh, character of uh, geoparks in Asian Pacific region. We have numerous ethnic groups, different nationalities, speak different language, we have different history, traditions, habits, and mentality, as well as the way of living. Though, of course, foods, costumes, buildings, 
a lot of difference. So it's also a high cultural diversity in the Asian Pacific region. So given the high geodiversity, biodiversity, cultural diversity amongst the Asian Pacific Geoparks network, there would be no there would be not be a, a fixed model for all the geoparks. So every geoparks in this network should find out or explore or develop a way or pattern or paradigm which best fit your own territory. Why not ignoring the good practices of other geoparks? So this is a, a basic idea for what a networking can do in Asian Pacific geoparks network. So talk to the uh, essential aspects, what role can networking play in the development of geotourism in the Asia Pacific region? The first point, networking can make all the geoparks here to share a good practices. Because we are so diversified, a good practice can be found in different geoparks. For example, in some remote uh, areas in the countryside where the people normally uh, they don't have enough land to grow they went to big cities to find job there but as the geoparks developers they have already found uh, their own way to produce bio teas and uh, using very traditional uh, agricultural way or the methods to grow their own teeth. And this tea is proven to be very valuable and very tasty. So this development, they also sustain the local community and they bring uh, the villages to prosperous. So many uh, people, they went to big towns and now they, big, uh, they are coming back to work in their homeland within this job park. That's only because they find a proper way to develop their own homeland. So the second part I'd like to mention, that's a networking. For that one, let us share brilliant ideas. So we have so many job parks. Every job parks may have creative ideas or innovative ideas. Some can be very brilliant. I'll just give you a, a, a little example. In this picture, this is from Zugun UNESCO Global Geopark. So they have uh, uh, made old geological history like big leaf is this. But this, each leaf is actually uh, actually a sheet of rock. They covered all the, the old uh, photos and uh, make it a big book. So people go for here and they can find, can learn the history of this region and the experience of a larger extent from the Cambria to other vision to, to the modern society. So this is a very big uh, example that can be learned from other UNESCO global geoparks. The third aspect for the networking uh, to develop geotourism, that is different geoparks within this network. They can experience successful management in the network because the APG normally organize some coordinated activities. So different geoparks workers, they have visited other sister geoparks or they visit other similar uh, geoparks with similar uh, uh, geo size or the history. So where they can learn successful management within our network. So this is also uh, the right example here. This is a desert uh, geopark in the northwest part of China. And also we, this good example is also introduced to our colleagues in Saudi Arabia. And the people there come here to learn how they can manage such a good geopark in a desert area. 
that's just what the Saudi Arabia want to do at the moment. The fourth point, that is also very important, that's with, through networking, we can avoid ineffective measures or arrangements in some job parks. Through networking, people know each other, and then they will find some ineffective measures or Hello, Prof. Are you there? I think there is a connection problem. Okay. Because there is a problem with uh, Professor Jin Xiaozi. Maybe we can move to the last one. Professor Nicol Ni. Hello, Prof. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Ni hao, Prof. Yeah, ni hao. Uh, <laughs> uh, Professor Nicol Ni is from uh, Department of Environmental and Cultural Resources, National Tsinghua University, Taiwan. Oh, Taiwan. I will study. Taiwan, over yes. I, I was a student of National Chia University, Prof. Oh, yeah, it's a good place. <laughs> yeah, I was a Oh, so you can speak Mandarin well. Yeah, uh, <laughs> recording in progress. Okay, uh, Professor Nicol Ni will talk about the community community based uh, geotourism respond to things under disaster. Uh, your time is 20 minutes, Professor, and there will be a QA session. Uh, we're gonna collect all the question, and we're gonna answer it in the in the end of the session. Okay? Uh, yes. So, okay. Yeah. There you go. Time is yours, Prof. Please. Yeah. So may I make sure? Yeah. Can everybody can see my slide or not? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. So I need to. Uh, I'm sorry because I'm not good at uh, the the room. So. Uh, let me check again. So, ah, hala, hala. Yeah, but may uh, yeah. So everybody can see, right? Yeah. I'm sorry, but it's okay right now. Okay, hen hao. Hen hao. Okay. Hen hao. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, today, uh, I'm I'm Nico Ni from Taiwan. Just you uh, like the moderator say uh, he, he had been a, a student in Taiwan. Uh, today, yeah, I will, uh, I will talk to you about the community-based Jutorian CBG response to change under disaster. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, uh, yeah, the previous, the pre the pre the previous uh, speech speakers, they mentioned about the geotourism is focused focus is on the uh, nature landscape like the stone the volcano and so on but today i will show you another kind of geotourism uh, in this in this place you can see a lot of creatures not a stone not a volcano and uh, it's the first one and uh, the second one i will show you just uh the, the three speeches speakers mentioned about uh, the geo park i know it's a big it's a big area park but for me yeah i think even in a village in a small place you also can develop the, the geo tourism so my topic is about the community-based tourism. Everybody knows the community-based tourism. 
But today I create a new word, a new a com compound word, CBG. Yeah, means the community based tourism. Okay, so it's okay. I'm I make sure. Yeah, I'm still here, right? Yes, Prof. Uh, but can you full screen the PPT, please? The PowerPoint. So can you see? Can yeah, you see? I, I move the I move the, the the PowerPoint, right? Yeah, yeah, I can. See. Okay, good. So the next, yeah, I will assure you. Yeah, actually, I I haven't been long back a, a couple of times, and uh, I also visit the Rinjani Mountains for my dual tourism. Yeah, you know, here is. Uh, at the bottom of the volcano, and uh, yeah, I see, I see, I see the map and how to go the go how to go the 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 uh, crater lake, crater lake, and uh, I see a, a lot of uh, the the notice and the interpretation, and uh, everybody knows, yeah, it's the entrance to the Rinjani Mountain. And uh, on the way, you know, it's a tough, it's tough hiking for us, for common people. So I appreciate the porters. They carry all my food and, uh, and my luggage. Finally, after the tough, the long hiking, I see the crater lake. It's amazing and uh, beautiful. So I love Lombok. And uh, I also took uh, the panoramic uh, photo for this lake. Yeah, it's me. Yeah, why I show you, I share my experience for the Lombok uh, because, yeah, because I, I push the, the geo tourism. So today I will show you my research about the, the Taiwan case. Uh, actually, my presentation are divided into the two parts. The part one is about the theoretical, theoretical framework. Actually, I built a integrated framework by the, by the vulnerability and the resilience. Again, vulnerability and the resilience theory. And I try to use the framework to examine and discuss my case study in Taiwan in Taomi village. Yeah, let's go. So yeah, it's my my integrative framework with the, the two theory, vulnerability and the resilience. I know it, it's very complicated. So I will skip and shorten the framework construction. And I just show you, it will include the Thai axis discussion and the, the structure agency discussion and the essential, the meaning discussion, I know it's complicated, but don't worry. I will take the example for you. So I will take, take I, I will give you the example. Tell me, it's a local place and a local village in the Taiwan. So where is the Tao me? Yeah, you know, Taiwan is beside the mainland China. Yeah, so is a is a is an island the Taomi village is located located at the, the the middle of the taiwan actually you can see the satellite map it's a mountain area so you can see a lot of the nature landscape and the ecological uh, scenery here uh here is a small village but why I mentioned this village? Because before the 1999, here most of people um, adopt the agriculture, like the, the planted the mushroom, bamboo shoot, and the water bamboo. Yeah, it's a so common, it's a so common village at that time. But in 1999, a big earthquake damage here. The, all the village almost damaged and de destructed. So yeah, you can see the, the building, yeah, the building crash. And uh, most of 
uh, around the, the 62 percent damage rate in this village but you know everybody every uh, each community face the disaster need to recover so in taiwan you know a lot of uh, natural disaster so that's why i use the resilience or the vulnerability to combine them to be my framework because i know much many many community will face the crisis events under the global globalization like you know you know uh, especially like the, the climate exchange the like climate change uh, in the global so I use the framework. I hope I can trace in the crisis event for this village. So you can see, you can see the scale. So every community you can, you can face, you can encounter the global or regional or local scales uh, if crisis event. And uh, the, the, the different level of the in, impact like the disaster is serious, is most serious. And uh, the second one is the middle, is the disturbance. Yeah, it's the middle. And uh, the, the, the little, the little serious is could be the stressor. So I know even the, the geopark and as well as the, the, the village, they can, they can face the different the impact. So in my, in my village, yeah, you can see, oh, you can see the uneven development. Yeah, because everybody hope to can hope to learn the money, the earn the money, the make the money, but maybe it's unfair. And uh, sometimes outside the investment is so huge. Maybe it could be occupied a lot of uh, money. So maybe it's not good for the local people. So, hmm how to solve these problems so okay so i find i found a, a study a, a, a example in taiwan in taomin so i talk to you and assure you and uh, the first one i use it the, i use the i use the framework of the transformation analysis for crisis right now after the, the earthquake after after the disaster I, I know, everybody know, new opportunity and the alternative is so important. So after the earthquake in 1999, this village make the transfer, the most first transformation. What's the transformation? They become the eco village. Yeah, they attract a lot of tourists to see the flag and uh, the three fly, flies, what's the three flies? It could be included the butterfly, dragonfly, and the fireflies. Yeah, a lot of tourists, uh, including the Taiwanese people and the, the, the foreigner, went there to see the, 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 the creatures. And uh, around the 10 years later, you know, they, they built, they moved a, a paper dune in two, 2008. What's the paper dune park? Paper dune, this, this dune uh, moved from the Japan. Actually, in 1995, in Osaka, in Japan, also had a, a big earthquake. At that time, every Every, everything is everything is crashed and uh, the people need to the religion the religion the religious center so they built they built a temporary paper dome paper church so for for their worship their jesus jesus 10 years later in the 2005 they will abandon the paper dome. And this village 
help can help to accept the used the paper done and uh, yes they move into the the village and become the second transformation in this in this village also a lot of uh, tourists come here came here and uh, to see the special the special paper dome so everybody can make the money uh, including the b and b and the restaurant and the, the 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 farmer so this case study taught me they overcomes the crisis on even development because a lot of uh, local people can earn the money the second the second one i'm sorry so everybody still there yes i can hear you okay so, thank you yeah i'm sorry yeah sorry yeah because of uh, some disturbance uh, for me but uh, but anyway yeah i try to i, I try to i'm sorry i try to uh, uh, keep on my my presentation yeah and the second the second is about the recovery yeah you know about the connection is so is so important after the disaster why the because uh if everybody can help you yeah you can make it help yeah from the others so So uh, yeah, you can see we we divide into two two kind of uh, inside the connection. Uh, I, I I keep as uh, quickly I see yeah they are in, they are have a three uh, association in in the in this village, uh, village. and uh, also the outside the connection like the new home foundation the public sector and the university and the private enterprise. Why the connection is so important after disaster? Because you know, yeah, there are a, a couple of uh, association. They can overcome the crisis. The association disabilities, and uh, if you can connect to the the outside the the, the, the organization, yeah, you can have uh, the help the, at that time. So just I mentioned of the paper dome park, actually. It's, it's a new home foundation is a new home foundation uh, move move into here move into here and uh, right now and at that time he made he made a lot of money so actually this foundation transferred to the social enterprise not a common NGO so it's overcome the crisis uh, the main benefit into the paper down park so what's my point the social enterprise is so important here so right now i i will talk to you the the, the third one the third one is about the stability the stability yeah you know after the the, the disaster yeah you can see the carry capacity and the treasure treasure concept is so important so in this village the, the good community cohesion improve the social uh, uh, capacity i'm sorry <laughs> yeah i'm here i'm sorry because it's too noisy in my environment yeah so yeah quickly yeah so yeah i will talk to you yeah look here yeah it, it can improve the social camp capacity and uh, the wet land ended and the species uh, diversification it will increase the eco ecological capacity and also the industry and the threshold by the cooperation yeah yeah will you will make the economic stability so it's my point right now 
the trinity of the key persons of association of a, and the ecological interpreter and the owner of the BNB. What's the trinity? So I mean, so the sound of the local resident plays three, three roles because they could be the key person of the, the associations and he, he could be the, the ecological interpreter, interpreter and he could be uh, the owner of the BNB. So even everybody knows the, the more outside investment is not good for local people. But even the, the, the outsider, they will follow this rule because you know it's a dual tourism. Everybody need to keep or maintain the nature environment. And uh, everybody will make the money. And uh, even you are outside, you will join the, the, the community associations. So that's why this, I, this, uh, this village, uh, village is so good for, it could be a model or example for the geotourism tourism in community level. So using my framework, yeah, I, I, I analysis by the step one and step two and step three. So, and I will make the comprehension analysis for my case study. So in my, my, my case study taught me, yeah, my local tracer events, more local tracer events and the few disaster, except the, the earthquake represents, represents the low, low vulnerability in Taomi. Yeah, there are not big disaster here. And uh, the trinity of a resident rules and the guided of a social enterprise and the creative idea for each 10 years have reduced the vulnerabilities and increased the resilience in Taomi village. And uh, I will say the community had a focus on the niche market in the rural landscape and had made an ideal resilient model in CBG, community-based geotourism. Yeah, in the future, yeah, I know, yeah, in advantage of course to the, the popular mass tourism destination of a summer lake in Taiwan. So it will encounter a strong transformation in the future. So the big challenge in 2020s, how to make it more freshness for tourists to continue a geotourism tourism is so important. So finally, I would say the crisis comes trends resulting from its vulnerability, but could maybe get into a new resilient opportunity in Taomi village. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just, uh, just I dis uh, disturb, uh, disturb you a lot. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you so much. Xie uh, thank you so much for a very good presentation. And yeah, uh, this is the end of the session uh, because we are running out of time. Uh, there will be only a conclusion, a closing statement for every uh, keynote speaker. Uh, for, for the first one will be by Professor Ibrahim Como. If there is any closing statement, please, time is yours. Hello, Professor Ibrahim Como. Is there any closing statement that you want to share with us? So the time is yours. If there is something that you want to say. Hello. OK. Uh, how about Professor Noel Scott? Are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Ah, yeah. Yeah, Professor. Is there any closing statement that you want to give to us or some advice to our uh, tourism in Lombok or, uh, or in Indonesia, please? Oh, well, um, first of all, I'd like to thank my co-speakers uh, for their excellent comments. Uh, I've learned a lot from, from their work, so thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I think uh, in, in, in parting, I think that... Uh, the the idea of geotourism is a wonderful thing um, and it can 
help and support both local people and protect the environment and protect the geological heritage of a country. Those are all good. Um, may I suggest that um, not everyone who goes to a geotourism park is a geotourist in a very strict sense. They will often go to experience the scenic beauty of the place. They will go to um, perhaps learn about uh, about the um, geological heritage and of the place. But I think that they want, and I think this is what the people in uh, UNESCO were saying earlier, that people want a wider range of experiences. And um, so I think there's lots of opportunities to develop those in Lombok through perhaps as uh, Professor Nee was saying, through uh, community-based tourism and, uh, and local development. Um, and I wish you well with it. I hope that uh, it's successful. Don't lose sight of just the, the basic things that tourists can provide, like food, souvenirs, uh, which people can provide to tourists, food, souvenirs, and so on, which will enhance their experience as well. But thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Noel Scott. Uh, now we're going to go to Professor Jin Xiaozhi. Are you there, Prof? Hello. Yeah, uh, please, if you have some advice about uh, the tourism or the, the, the geotourism in Indonesia, particularly in Lombok, maybe about the networking to develop uh, the geotourism in Rinjani or in Lombok. So please, time is yours. Yeah, good. Yeah, first of all, uh, to, uh, to say sorry because uh, my talk was uh, stopped uh, uh, due to the bad connection. But I rechecked that. That I stopped uh, almost. Uh, that was my last uh, slide. So uh, I didn't miss much of my talk. So for uh, my suggestion for uh, Lankavi, uh, no, uh, for uh, Rinjani Lombard, I'd like to say. You have done a very great job since last year organizing the Geotourism Fest. And this year you have uh, organized a second one. And this played a very active role for the networking in the Asian Pacific Geopark uh, Network. So as a, co a coordinator of APGN, I'd like to uh, suggest you to continue to do that and to do more uh, networking with other global job parks and uh, keep going and uh, you have a bright future. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Professor Jin Xiaozi. Uh, for the next one is Professor Nikol Ni. Hello, yes. Prof. Uh, actually, yeah, uh, just we mentioned about, yeah, most of people focus the the geo the geo park yeah like the rinjani mountain yeah it's so special so in lombok maybe not everybody can share the, the rinjani income so why i uh, focus in the community based geo tourism because it's easy to do because if you are community, there are a lot of resources or the nature landscape, how to manage it, how to keep yeah. it, <laughs> and uh, how to attract tourists to visit there. And uh, the community member, the resident, could make the money. Yeah, so if you are lo not located in the Rinjani mountain, and uh, if you locate in another place, if you make the, 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 the uh, community a uh, best geotourism, uh, it also can make money and uh, make the economic development there and uh, improve the social stability. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the professor or all the uh, keynote speaker. For uh, finally, uh, this is the end of this session. Thank you so much for all the experts for today for, and also the participants for attending this event. If you have any additional questions, please you can read the, our expert through email or even uh, through any media, so, social media. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, finally, uh, we come to the end of this 
uh, international conference, we would like to say thanks again, again and again to the expert for the important message and also for the audience uh, who are very active. And last but not least, thank you so much for guest sponsor and media reporter. Hopefully, uh, the international conference will be informative and useful for everyone. Thank you so much. For the conclusion, the simple conclusion is that uh, that I got from this uh, session, geotourism is how to make visitor aware and to gain some understanding of the geolog geological feature that surround them. Geotourism is the kind of travel that sustain of enhance to geographical characteristic of a place and its environment, culture, aesthetic, heritage, as well as well-being of local people. I am Azi. Until next time, have a nice day. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much. So there will be...
magnificent piece of nature left by the great people of our ancient past. It is up to us in our prime of youth to love and care in peace and harmony. Together hand in hand to build upon what we are given for generations to come to see the grand beauty of our nature. The heaven on earth. Indonesia.
and peace of nature left by the great people of our ancient past. It is up to us in our prime of youth to love and care with peace and harmony. Together, hand in hand, to build upon what we are given for generations to come to see the grand beauty of our nature. The heaven on earth. Indonesia. Beautiful land with the rich nature created by hand of Almighty God. We are very blessed to live in this land. But now we forget to love and now we forget to save. We only become a connoisseur. Enjoy the nature without having to destroy. Created by hand of Almighty God, we are very blessed to live in this land. But now we forget to love, and now we forget to save. We only become a connoisseur, enjoy the nature without having to destroy your needs.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy and to be uh, the moderator this afternoon in this uh, special occasion of uh, Geotourism Fest and International. Let's get started. I would like to say it also. Uh, expert would give the talk this afternoon uh, would be Miss Helen Martin. Unfortunately, Miss Helen Martin uh, could not couldn't uh, come and present uh, her presentation this afternoon due to something. Uh, happened on the way to the heaven and uh, respectfully he's excuse us for <laughs> something uh, what we called it uh, long backstage discuss anyone would like to uh, uh, Let everybody know uh, our respectable uh, expert that would like to give a talk of the presentation. It's supposed to be Miss Helen Martin, but uh, unfortunately that she's not able to come and join us this afternoon. Uh, therefore, uh, she sent her best regard to all of us here. But we also have uh, Dr. Patricia Erfurt, and then would be Mr. Kazuhiro Nobe and Ms. Jagoda Wolensins and uh, Professor David Nusam. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Uji Gavar. would like to give uh, first to uh, Dr. Patricia Erfurt. Are you there? Can you hear me, Dr. Patricia? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much uh, for joining us this afternoon. We highly appreciate it. Uh, time is yours. I need a shared screen, please. 
Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we could hear I you need, clearly. Thank you. Yeah, I need a shared screen for my presentation, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I need you a may shared start screen. It, can you please arrange that I can share the screen? Beg your pardon? I need a shared screen. Okay. Yes, you can, please. Oh, okay. Um, hang on, let me just click here. That's the wrong screen. Here we go. Here we are. Okay, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure. good afternoon or good evening, nearly, from Australia. And thank you for the opportunity to speak about volcano-based geotourism development. Um, as the tourism minister, Santiago Uno, pointed out so clearly earlier, COVID-19 is a game changer. And that these current times require us to be more innovative, more resilient, and more collaborative than ever. That's why for the present time, we have to focus on two different types of geotourism development. One that allows international travel again, eventually, and one that caters for virtual or online visits of volcanic destinations in the meantime. Regarding the development of volcanic geotourism, <clears throat> the main focus of this presentation is on several key subjects. They're coming in a moment. <laughs> if you have a look at the pictures on the left, they are examples <clears throat> of volcanic mass tourism where visitors arrive in tour buses by car and by ropeway. Both volcanoes are active and dangerous, but they are closely monitored <clears throat> and every attempt is made to keep people safe. For this presentation, I have selected a number of key topics which will be addressed and explained why they are so important. With nearly 130 active volcanoes, the potential for volcanic geotourism in Indonesia is enormous. Every time a volcano erupts somewhere in the world, the message is spread quickly and volcano tourism receives another free promotion. Wherever possible, people will also try to get as close to the action as they can, as the recent eruptions in Iceland have shown. While there are travel restrictions at the moment, this would be the ideal time to further develop the virtual exploration of exciting volcanic geosites and to continue the promotion of the unique natural and cultural heritage of Indonesia's volcanic areas. As a national tourism strategy, all forms of geotourism have a future, especially in a country with an abundance of natural and cultural resources. But as with other forms of nature-based tourism, the principles of sustainability must have priority, especially with view to any impact on the natural, the social, the cultural and economic environment. To preserve the natural and cultural geoheritage for future generations, it is therefore essential to use a responsible best practice management approach. There are a lot of conditions that must be considered to provide a safe but still authentic tourism experience. Most importantly, only volcanoes that are closely monitored should be considered as geotourism destinations. Warnings of raised activity levels must be reliable and instant. Also, suitable shelters must be provided in case of unexpected eruptions. Tour operators must provide suitable personal protective equipment to all visitors. 
and detailed safety information must be made available to tourists prior to visiting active volcanic areas. Another requirement is that emergency and rescue teams must be on standby in case they are needed. That's why it is important that emergency management strategies for eruptive events are in place for every active volcanic tourist destination. More details about risk management in a moment. Looking at cooperation across different tourism industry sectors, this is a great plus for geotourism. As you can see, there are specific sectors that synergize well and can contribute even more diversity to the concept of geotourism. In the case of volcano tourism, there are particular particularly close links to hot spring tourism, which again is connected to health and wellness tourism, which by itself is a booming tourism industry. Depending on the volcanic region, there's also overlap into adventure tourism or dark tourism. Dark tourism where visitors can observe former sites of volcanic disasters, like Pompeii for instance. To benefit from such collaboration, um, special geo trials are very useful to connect various points of interest. And at this point, I would like to include a reference to Professor Noel Scott's presentation. When it comes to geo trials, creative arts would be a wonderful integration for geo trials. So they offer an extra uh, element for people. Um, ecotourism specifically contributes to the diversity of natural and cultural geoheritage sites. And often there are opportunities to observe local wildlife or take part in marine activities while engaging in volcanic geotourism. The fact is geotourism has something to offer for everybody, every age group and every interest. One of the objectives of geotourism is to encourage the observation and study of our surrounding environment. This includes the appreciation of natural as well as cultural resources. Volcanic geotourism provides an opportunity to explore unique areas on one hand, and on the other hand, people are invited to learn about regional traditions and customs. Here again, the development of specially designed geo trails that combine natural and cultural attractions are most advantageous. This is another very important part um, because active volcanic areas can harbor significant hazards and risks for tourists. They should only be visited with qualified tour guides who are familiar with the area. And because volcanic areas are somewhat unpredictable, tour guides must be trained to recognize potentially dangerous situations to avoid exposure to any volcanic hazards for their tour groups. To attain the necessary knowledge, special training courses should be developed to provide tour guides with the right qualifications to lead tourists into potentially hazardous environments. This is particularly important as we must bear in mind that in case of an eruptive event or unexpected toxic gas emissions, the tour guides would be equally affected and not able to help anybody else. This is not always clearly understood. This is the most important subject and there are a number of conditions that must be taken into account some of which I have already briefly mentioned. Especially with a view to the tragic events in recent years in Japan and New Zealand, where both times many lives were lost due to an unexpected eruption. Therefore, only volcanoes that are monitored 24 seven and with no raised activity levels should be considered for geotourism activities. With 127 active volcanoes in Indonesia, 
there surely is enough choice to focus on the more predictable ones. Another point of importance is the provision of suitable shelters for quick access in case of an, emergent, uh, an unexpected eruption. Such shelters, preferably from reinforced concrete, are a minimum requirement and must be located where tourists could be in danger from eruption fallout or from pyroclastic density currents. And even volcanoes that are currently dormant should have concrete shelters that tourists can reach quickly, just in case. Entering active volcanic environments also requires suitable personal protection, which tour operators must provide to all tour group members. Gas masks, for instance, must have filters that are suitable for toxic gas emissions because they are not uncommon in volcanic areas. There must be escape routes that are clearly marked and all tourists must be aware of what to do in an emergency. This brings it back to the need for qualified tour guides. Also, it is essential that emergency and rescue services are aware at any time about tourist numbers in active volcanic areas. There are several lessons to be learned from the past and hopefully this will help to make volcano tourism in your country as safe as possible. Actually, risk management starts already with the selection of suitable geosites that have guaranteed access by road or air in case this becomes necessary for rescue missions. Using strict safety guidelines and timely warnings can make risk management much more successful in active volcanic areas. When it comes to active volcanoes, there cannot be too many warnings. Erring on the side of caution is better than warning too late. And finally, all authorities in charge of emergency and rescue must anticipate possible crisis situation, situations that could overwhelm rescue services. Many active volcanoes worldwide are located in protected areas. These include not only national parks or world heritage sites, but also national and global geoparks, as well as other protected sites. To support the conservation of the natural and cultural geoheritage in volcanic areas, education is a great method to raise awareness among geotourists. This in turn should encourage people to consider the effect of tourism on the environment and lead to a reduction in the size of our overall ecological footprint, which is far too big already. Here's a thought. A program for geo-accreditation or geo-certification for volcanic geotourism could be developed for several reasons. To identify authentic geo-heritage sites, to provide a genuine experience based on the responsible use of natural and cultural geo-heritage, to recognize responsible geotourism development and sustainable destination management, and to endorse qualified professional geotourism operators and tour guides with important and valuable credentials, such a seal of approval in the form of a geo um, accreditation could be another useful marketing tool. To develop volcanic geotourism as an independent tourism sector, there is of course the need for essential infrastructure, usually in the form of roads, transport and car parks, etc. This is often existing infrastructure that can be shared with the general public or with other forms of tourism. Supporting public services and amenities must be available for visitors. Special consideration must be given to communication services because travelers today rely heavily on their digital devices. No reception is bad for any tourism, but in case of an emergency, it can mean the difference between life and death. Visitor centers and volcano museums are great attractions and also boost employment and the local economy. 
accessible and well-maintained walking tracks with wheelchair access together with shaded viewing areas are also essential parts but there are many other parts that need to be included in infrastructure for geotourism and of course in national parks geoparks and other protected sites information boards are needed in suitable locations One thing is crucial for volcanic geotourism development. Visitor safety must always come before economic considerations. To achieve this, all stakeholders must work together and there must be an agreement on safe conduct at all times. Also, active volcanoes should never be visited alone. Guided tours with qualified guides are the better option. It is possible to make volcano volcanic geotourism safe, but this means risk avoidance at any cost. The tourism sector can only be as safe as tour operators, governments and monitoring agencies are prepared to make it for visitors of active volcanic areas. This is why volcanic visitor centers and volcan volcano museums are a great alternative. And right now, the increasing use of virtual reality is an important option to study volcanic environments from a safe distance. With careful planning, the positive aspects should certainly outweigh most of the potential risk factors of volcano tourism. And this is the last slide. Thank you for your time. Well, that was uh, an outstanding presentation. Uh, Thank you. I just tried to get efforts. back to you. And uh, I would like to ask the participant, maybe there would be some, uh, it's uh, time for Q&A season. I would like to uh, also mention, I forgot to mention to all the participant and the respectable expert that uh, Ms. Patricia Everett, PhD, is a research scientist on, at Geotourism Australia with uh, main interest is in risk management in active volcanic and hydrothermal environments and the conservation of natural and uh, cultural uh, geoheritage. Uh, let's check if there's any uh, question. Well, uh, once again, I would like to uh, highly appreciate it to uh, Ms. Patricia of a PhD uh, for joining us this afternoon, unfortunately, because uh, we haven't got enough time. But please, uh, whoever the participant would like to uh, uh, ask more deeply about uh, the geotourism development in the volcanic area, you may... Would it be okay, Ms. Uh, Patricia Alford, that uh, yes. the person can contact you directly through your email? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. So, Thank therefore, you. without further ado, we uh, continue to the next uh, expert. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Mr. Kazuhiro Nobe. Uh, yes. Are you there, Mr. Kazuhiro Nobe? Can you hear me? Okay, yes. Okay, thank you very much. It's your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you share my presentation? Yes, we can clear you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Kazuhiro Nobe, and it's my pleasure uh, to present during this wonderful uh, conference. I'd like to thank the, uh, the organizer for giving me uh, this opportunity. I work for the OK Island UNESCO Global Geopark as the office head of the promotion committee. Today, I will talk about some of the geotourism activities in the OK Island Geopark. Next, please. Uh, this is uh, the overview of the presentation, the first location and the features of the OK Island UNESCO Global Geopark 
Second, geopark facilities are the destination of sustainable tourism. Third, a geopark brand. Fourth, uh, towards highlighting outdoor activities. Last, a new uh, regional framework for geotourism we are currently planning. Uh, the, this, the Oki okay Islands are located in the west, western part of Japan on the Sea of Japan. There are four inhabited islands and about 180 smaller uninhabited islands. Seen from Japan's main island Honshu, the closer three inhabited islands are known as Dozen, and the largest island behind them is called Dogo. The main office of the Geopark uh, Itsuko facility is located on the largest island Dogo. Recently, in July last month, a small office was opened on one of the smaller islands, Nakanoshima. Next. Next, please. Okay. Oki Islands were designated as a global geopark in 2013 and revalidated uh, for the first time in 2017. So we are now preparing for our second revalidation. Because they are isolated islands, the, life, the lifestyles of the people of Oki lay on the marine em environment and the fishing industry. So the area of the sea surrounding the island is also included in the geopark. The total population is around 19,000. The biggest island has around 14,000 and the smallest island has only 650 residents. Next, next please. Okay, and a small archipelago, but they are full different resources. We explain the local resources by separating them into three themes, job history, unique ecosystem, and lifestyle and traditions. To find the relationship between these three elements, we have created the uh, catchphrase, discover connection. Most people are not geological specialists, so we explain the geopark by asking basic questions about simple topics and search for the answer together. Next. In the theme lifestyle and tradition, we ask visitors why were two emperors exiled to the Oak Island? Why are there so many different traditions of the festivals? All these things are connected to the geography uh, or the landscape created by volcanic activities, etc. Next. In the theme unique ecosystem, we ask visitors why do plants from south and north of Japan, continental plants and subalpine plants grow next to each other on the coast. We explain that it is connected uh, to the geology and the sea currents. Next. Oak Islands have many places with beautiful coastal landscape. It is important to explain to beaters not only about how these landscapes were formed, but also bring their attention to the fact that these landscapes go through a con constant changes. Moreover, we want the visitor to know not only about the Oak Island, but also about the Japanese archipelago, the Earth, and even about the Earth interior. Next. Next, let me introduce some projects related to uh, geotourism on the Oak Island. Over the last few years, the Geopark worked to the created sustainable uh, base for implementing a sustainable tourism program. This includes creating, creating base facilities on all four islands. 
from data, we know that 90% of tourists, tourists allowed to the island by ferry. Therefore, the ports are the main entrance to the island because of that. With cooperation from local administration, we have set up job park facilities in each port. Next. The core facilities is on the biggest island. The facilities are the key to effectively uh, provide information with us uh, and uh, strengthen, strengthen the geoparks uh, present, presence in the turi tourism field. The main facility, Okeran Geopark Vita Center, opened last year. The Geopark main office is located on the first floor on the building along with a tourism office a small book center a, book, a small book corner and rest area for beaters to use freely before the job park office was uh, in a government building close off from beaters now uh, we are right in the port next to the tourism office. This has brought the attention of visitors to the fact that the Oak Island uh, Joe Park and uh, significantly raised its visibility. Next. On the second floor uh, of the buildings in the Oak Island Joe Park Museum, opened in April 2021, only four months ago, the museum serves as a starting point when venturing into the Joe Park. It's a place where tourism can familiarize themselves with the concept of Joe Park and sustainable tourism. We also hope that the visit to the museum will change the way to beat us explore the Joe Park. Next. In July 2021, another new Joe Park facility hotel, Ento, was opened. It's located on, on one of the smaller islands, Nakanoshima. The building on the right is the main building of the hotel, which has gone through renovations. The building on the left is a newly constructed part of the hotel. Other than hotel rooms, it also has small job park office and job park exhibition room. Next. Oh, sorry, next. And next. Oh. And to combine the function, function of the hotel and the base facility of the job park, the hotel uh, puts value on the time visitors interact with us and try to create an at atmosphere in which the visitors can feel at ease, uh, surrounded by nature. It also works to present the value of the sustainable uh, through its operation. Next. The exhibition room, Geo Room Discover, much information about the job history of Earth and the Oak Island, the small exhibit uh, which show local culture and nature are uh, all white or gray with a simple design. This is done on purpose to make to the beetle want to go outside, find those places and see them in real life in full color. Next to the exhibition is a lounge, job park office, and the small library corner. Uh, all of these are open to both hotel guests and all, all other visitors and residents. Next. The new hotel building is constructed using cross laminated timber, CLT which is made by uh, putting together uh, layers of wood. The wood used for the panels to build into 
comes from trees that would otherwise be white waste material. CLT has a smaller em environment uh, footprint than steel and con concrete. Hotel Ento is the first building of this size to be built using this method in Japan. Next. The amenity uh, offered to guests in the room are reusable, reusable uh, forever possibly, and uh, necessary item are made out of materials such as uh, bamboo, uh, bamboo fiber, glass, and cotton. The, the complementary water is served is glass containers. Next. This served in the hotel use products from the island and the region. The staff pays attention to provide the uh, guests with uh, stories related to the food and introduce the natural environment of the island. Next. Of course, it is also important for the outdoor uh, facility to, the, uh, to be gentle to the environment. This is especially important on the Oak Island, where many sites are away from the residential areas surrounding by rich nature. One of such sites is Kunia Coast, a beautiful site which is very popular among tourists. The trail itself leads through a pasture with many cows and horses grazing peacefully. The changes to the land were kept to minimum. Next. The town also implemented eco-friendly toilets, which minima minimize the use of water. They reuse the water used to wash hands and flush the toilet by cleaning and filtering it. The toilet use food pumps and therefore does not use fossil energy. This type of the toilet does not need electricity and water service. Next. At the Joe Park, we are also active in supporting local businesses to help small products be more uh, successful on the market. We implement the certified product system and the package and the design support program. The following are the main requirements for product certification and the product development support program. First, the applicant must be located in Oki. Second, the product must be manufactured in Oki. Third, over 50% of the product must be made with raw materials from Oki. Four, the applicant must have a sustainable manufacturing system. Fifth, the product must clearly represent, represent the Oki Islands. These strict requirements help to ensure the quality of certified uh, products. Package design support program helps to find the design of the package, packaging to make the products more appealing and promote sales. These initiatives seek to target local small businesses, individuals, and groups. Next. The co coordination to become a certified products are very hard to clear. So we only have two certified products as of now. The package design program is more popular. Nine program, nine pro products uh, have received the uh, subsidy uh, until now. And we have been receiving more and more applications in the current years. All products shown 
here have created new package using our support program. New package packaging costs the sales to increase three times for the two products on the left. The product on the left has also become our first certified products. Next. When uh, it comes to sustainable tourism up until now, we developed tours such as sea kayaking and hiking. In 2021, we started a new project tours on electric mountain bicycle. Right now, we are developing tours for tourists interested in the outdoors. The program will combine guide tours on electric bicycle with ski kayaking and hiking. Recently, more and more local people and organizations are interested in the geopark concept and cooperate with us. Local bodies are becoming more conscious about sustainable development and think together with us on how to revitalize the island. Next. The concept of geopark is slowly but surely spreading in the local tourism sector. Such geopark activities have been possibly, possibly, uh, possibly uh, evaluated in order to uh, create an even better uh, framework to revitalize the regional uh, tourism. We are planning to match with Oki Island Tourism Association in April next year. This tourism association is an organization that oversees tourism on all four islands. The new organization is expected to provide a more effective environment for the development of geotourism and local revitalization. Next. To sum up, for the last few years, we have focus on improving our job park facilities and other hardware so that we can provide tourists with more effective information, service, and make sightseeing around the island a smooth process. In the future, uh, we want to build on the already created base for the job tourism and use in activities revitalizing the job the region the job park concept has proven to the very successful in education on the islands and we want to achieve the same in regional development and tourism too with this i'd like to end my presentation uh, thank you for your attention Mr. Kazuhiro Nobe, that was a, a remarkable uh, presentation. And uh, please be advised that we, we have a similarity in Ireland, where we're coming from. <laughs> in Lombok, we've got a few small islands that might be similar with Oki Islands over there. Since uh, we haven't got a, a question from a participant, I would like to ask you a question. It's very interesting that you've got this uh, a tourist association on, on every island. Uh, we, did, we did such a thing too on, on our island of Lombok, but it seems like uh, it's not work uh, uh, properly. Is there any uh, key, uh, key thing that we might apply in order to be able for us to, to do? I understand that we cannot apple to apple between Oki Island and, and our uh, UNESCO Global Geopark on, on, on the island. In this case, of course, uh, when it's related to, ed to education, standard of education, uh, in Oki Island, I, I, I believe it's slightly better than we've got in here in Rinjani uh, and Lombok. Uh, is there anything that you can advise us when it's really, uh, regarding the, the, the key stakeholders, what I call it, uh, as the, the tourist, uh, Tourism Association? 
So, hello, uh, my name is Yagoda. I will help with translation during the questions. Yes, please. Thank you. あの、同じのように各島には、あの、走りというのを、あの、教材施設を置いて、でもあまりうまく運営しなかった、できなかったので、大きいので、あの、なんかあの、お勧めのレコメンデーションとして成功しているのか。ジョーパックという考え、大き
but embedded within that is a, a significant percentage is nature tourism, ecotourism, and geotourism, and particular, uh, and in particular visits to geoparks um, around the world. The actual data is interesting. It, it, the actual data is is well in tune with the forecast, and you can see from the um, uh, the Asia Pacific part of the graph there that the Asia Pacific really has expanded significantly in the last five years or so, with massive increases in uh, international and domestic tourism in places like Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, and Thailand. But, and of course, you could uh, just going back to that, you can see the yellow for Europe, also massive increases in Europe. We ended up with a situation where Europe, and, and, and it really started in Europe, that, that local communities, the, the people who in many ways were seen to benefit from all of this tourism, started complaining. They said that the prices were going up, people couldn't get rents, the price of buying a house had quadrupled, the food was more expensive, what they, the streets were congested. And there was resistance in places in like Italy and in Spain and in France. And you could see this graffiti, tourists go home, which is interesting, which indicates to me that the golden egg of tourism is sort of <laughs> is being broken in many parts of the world. Why was it like this? Why did people think, start to think like this? And why did this graffiti start appearing in Europe? Well, people didn't like congestion and crowding. And it's interesting to reflect now on a lot of the research that has come out um, around the world uh, in recent times, which promotes the health and particularly the psychological benefits of tourism, the benefits of being in nature. And these benefits um, are associated with enjoying peace and quiet, the outdoors and seeing wildlife. And of course, congestion and crowding does not allow that to happen. So those benefits were being eroded. If there are too many people, management can't really enforce regulations or control bad behavior. Um, there's two uh, diagram, there's two photographs here. There's one from the Jurassic Coastline World Heritage Site, which is the top one. And you can see massive erosion where people have just left the pathway and just walked down and eroded the slopes, trying to access the beach and lower slopes. The bottom one is a more remote site in Western Australia, where the rules are that you do not climb on the landforms, but you can see that there's someone climbing on the landforms because they're not the, the, even the regulations are not being enforced, even in a situation where there are not so many visitors in many other places. And in the list of things there, you can see that there's soil erosion, trampling vegetation, pollution and littering, and pollution and littering, as we'll see, are significant problems in Indonesia. And management, in, in an attempt to try and deal with that, come up with various uh, management scenarios to try and, and, and control things. And I'll develop that um, aspect a little bit later on. Let's, uh, let's bring ourselves uh, actually to um, Indonesia. This is um, um, a, a popular busy weekend with people trying to um, access um, a geopark in um, Indonesia. And this is before the COVID um, lockdown situation eventuated. And you can see from this that the, all the congestion problems that many people in Europe in particular do not like are being realized here. And this photograph on the left side of the slide here really illustrates the sort of condition uh, that can arise through heavy visitation. And what we have to ask ourselves is, is, is that, what are the impacts of, 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 of this sort of thing? Well, if we actually look at Rinjani in this table, this table is from the uh, Newsom, uh, the Kayadi and Newsom paper. You can see that um, before COVID, there was congestion, litter, waste, and vehicle emissions. 
And also there was fires and people feeding monkeys uh, and uh, management would really have a, a lot of difficulty in trying to deal with such, with, with such uh, a situation where there are so many people on site that it's impossible to police it. So it, it would be difficult to even fix anything that was damaged to repair paths that were eroded and so on. And this table taken from the paper um, highlights many geoparks and, and protected areas in Indonesia where these sort of problems were taking place. Oops. However, COVID came along. COVID came along and then allowed us to appreciate what might happen if all this congestion stopped. Sorry, just fiddling here. Going the wrong way, sorry folks. Now this was a, um, a, a projected data for the collapse in tourism around the world. And the actual reality of it is, it is much worse than those figures suggest. So what happened in Indonesia? So for example, what happened at Rinjani? No visitation. Well, the first thing we noticed, of course, there's no revenue. There's not all the, the revenue that's coming in that helps to um, provide a living for people and help for pay to manage the park. So all the businesses were closed. But on the uh, environmental side, there was reduced congestion, less waste, less air pollution, more wildlife was seen, and there was scope. There was scope for the recovery of wildlife, but, but for the birds monkeys and various species that also occur in the park to come back and, 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 and sort of recover from the stress of heavy human presence. And the site protection work could also be carried out. And this was something that was seen across all the studied geoparks and in some national parks that were studied in um, Indonesia. At the same time, however, the loss of income for local communities, for some local communities, was catastrophic. It was also noticed there was a decline in conservation activities because park management were not there to um, supervise and control any problematic situations and also deal with illegal activities. And you can see from this um, graph here that Indonesia is not really doing very well at all with the, the increase in uh, illegal logging activity that was noticed during the lockdown, because during the lockdown, a lot of conservation actions were halted. More poaching occurred, illegal mining occurred, and, and, and this uh, was measured on the ground on, by site observation and also in the case of logging by satellite imagery. So we go back to a situation where, okay, the world sort of recovered from uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We sort of thought that we had it under control and various countries around the world, including Indonesia, relaxed the uh, controls. And again, once again, people started going to the protected areas. Why did they go to the protected areas? Protected areas like geoparks, National parks were seen as places where you could have a healthy time and all those benefits to unwind from all the stress and difficulty that um, was uh, the problem pre-pandemic with uh, overcrowding and mass tourism situations. However, we're back to square one. So the, um, no, we don't seem to have learned from those previous problems that we had and we're back to all the problems that we had before, congestion, litter, waste, disturbance to wildlife, and all the things that were seen before that really do need attention in the longer run. This is Mount Ranjani, a photograph taken of people um, after lockdown uh, on, on August the 16th. And, and there's a couple of issues here. There's the, the, the sheer numbers of people um, whether you can enjoy yourself when it's so crowded is, 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 is always a good question, but also the, the, the virus could be transmitted very easily with such congestion as well. And again, um, Indonesian geoparks, um, uh, back to normal, 
back to normal. And this is where I, I, I come to one of the main points of, of this uh, presentation. And uh, there's the uh, crowding and, and Rinjani summit, August the 17th, 2020. And um, uh, I guess you're back in lockdown now, so maybe it does not like, it, it is not like this uh, at the moment. Mount Broma, again, just some photographs to illustrate the rush to get back to nature. And there's some important lessons that we can take from all this. Um, Susan Beckham from Griffith University made some points at a recent conference here in Western Australia. Uh, she called for tourism that is closer to home. However, domestic tourism um, as around the world, the rebound, has brought many problems. So the tourism that is closer to home is not working unless there's some sort of control. But she says in the next point that tourism needs to be of a higher value and less volume. And the question is, what are the solutions? How do we achieve that? She, she mentioned that host communities need a greater say in tourism policy and planning. Yes, I uh, agree, but the, the, uh, there are many cases, and this uh, one here, the Kinabatangan in, in, in Malaysia and Sabah, uh, was not a good example of host communities having a greater say because there was a massive explosion of local community-developed tourism. And in the absence of a regional tourism policy, many problems occurred and there were congestion related and pollution problems. And she makes the point, give nature a seat at the table. Absolutely. I think we all agree with that, but we do know from the, uh, the data, lots of data that conservation has been damaged by the pandemic. So what are our options? What are our options? What can we do? We can manage the site, we can educate, we can have a, start policing, do we zone, do we disperse, do we make, just make more geoparks and more protected areas to increase the number of sites? How do we control the visitor numbers? How do we do it? Who can go? Who can't go? How, how is, will it be done? Do we demarket? Do we make it more expensive? Or do we sometimes have to close an old park? So these are the options, and some of them are easier to do than others, but they all have their limitations and advantages. So trying to manage the problem, where well, they tried to do this in Taiwan, the Yeyulu case study in Taiwan, where they had lots of um, crowding, visitor supervision problems, and, and trying to manage the problem by the use of infrastructure. And this is the point that I want to make, that you have to be very, very careful about how you think about managing a problem. So at Yalu in Taiwan, they put boardwalks in, viewing platforms, walk trails, signage, interpretive panels. But as you see from the photograph, people are straying from the boardwalk and not abiding by the rules. There are people um, accessing the geology for selfies, personal photographs, and this is despite um, rangers being on site and even video surveillance and people saying, you will be fine if you climb on the landforms, but there are so many people there, it was difficult to control. And you can see here visitors climbing over the geology. And an example of site degradation, you have boardwalks there, but you can see there's all sorts of informal trails being developed. So the first thing that people think about is site management, but clearly when you have lots and lots of visitors, site management is not the only solution. And we have to go to what's been done in Europe now. They've had a, a big rise in domestic tourism issues in Europe and the overcrowding has simply been dealt with by the closure of major facilities, closure of parking areas, cease advertising, cease promotion. So, so closing sites or closing access to protected areas uh, under, under mass tourism scenarios was seen as, as a, something that needed to be done in Europe. And irresponsible. Ir 
Sorry about, sorry about that. Irresponsible users, um, there's all sorts of strategies that can be put in place, but there was an increased presence of, of rangers and um, local police. So this, this uh, paper by McGinley et al. 2020 just shows what, um, what people can do and have had to do to control mass, uh, a mass increase in domestic tourism. Um, so we have two choices, I think. I think we've got two choices. We, we, we can, when we think about where do we go from this point onwards, do we reflect on what it was like before or, uh, and, and, or, or not? If we don't reflect on what we went on before, then we could end up with just back to normal and lots of problems and uh, all those problems that I've highlighted very briefly um, in this talk. Or we can reflect and we can re re create a new awareness, but this requires action. So in, 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 in finishing up then, I, I, I want to just mention a few things. Um, the COVID-19 has resulted in more negative than positive environmental conditions, even though that we have been in lockdown situations. But the, but the nature tourism, the nature tourism has been um, severely disrupted. Um, Post-COVID easing of lockdown shows substantial increase in domestic tourism. And there's no evidence that we're going to do it better. So what are our options? What are we going to do? We need to reflect. We need knowledge. And of course, the paper by um, Harry Coyote and myself helps us to, gives us a knowledge set that we can work with. And there are other um, journal articles and knowledge sets out there can, that, that can help us through that. We need to commit. We need policy. We need action. That needs to be funded. Who is going to do that? Where are the funds coming from and who's going to administer those funds and what are the priorities? We need staff and we need training. And I think this is what we need from here on. I think this is my message to geopark management in Indonesia. Terima Kasi. <laughs> What this
Com. Please, Mr. Kazuhiro Nobe, yes. could you please give yes. us your thought on your closing statement? Oh, uh, Pastor, well, so let me uh, thank you again for inviting me and uh, giving me this opportunity to present today uh, during this amazing uh, conference. Since the time I first heard about the Jopa concept, I have uh, consi considered it to be a very important method uh, to developing the region uh, of the uh, Oki Island. The Jopa concept includes all the important aspects uh, uh, that are necessary for sustainable development. I hope that all participants today will be successful uh, their projects uh, to achieve uh, sustainability in their uh, respective regions. Uh, thank you again and goodbye. Sayonara. Arigato. Thank you very much, Anatani Aite Orisides, uh, <laughs> Mr. Kazuhiro Nobe. Uh, arigato Gozaimas. Hopefully, that we could see uh, all of you, uh, not through uh, online but offline. I really hope that. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for everybody and all the participants. Let's give us a round of applause for everybody and also to the respectable expert this afternoon. I am Uji Gavar. I am honored to stand before you to um, uh, be your moderator. But before then, I would like, we would like to uh, give us uh, our local performance that presented by um, Mataram Tourism Institute. This uh, dance is called Sasambu Dance. It's a representative of it's a represent of the three tribe that live in West, West Nusa Tenggara. So some, Sasambu stands for Sasak, is the main tribe uh, of people who live on the island of Lombok. And then uh, Samawa is the, 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 the tribe that live on the west part of uh, Sumbawa Island. And then Mbojo, uh, that's another tribe that live mostly on the, started from the middle island of Sumbawa to the eastern part. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much one more time. See you next time. Stay healthy, stay safe, and clean liners. All the best. Uji Gapar, let's enjoy the dance. Bye bye. <laughs>